without further ado, we're going to rush right into talking about what standards organizations and the Standards Coordinating Council are doing about the stuff that Mr. Daniel just mentioned. I'm Jamie Clark. I work for OASIS. Walking towards me is Victor Harrison, who's the Senior Vice President of OMG, and he's waving him in today. He's in good mood. And this is Mike, Mark Reichardt, who is the CEO of the Open Geospatial Consortium. So you're talking to three standards guys, basically. I have no idea what these slides say, so this ought to be fun to see if I have to pay attention to or not. Uh, we are only going to talk for a minute about what we've been up to lately to try and identify all the Lego blocks that currently exist that people use and are developing and are tooled and are available to do in a, on a sharing basis, the kind of stuff that we were just hearing discussed today. Essentially, you're talking to three of the members of the Standards Coordinating Council who are sort of the, uh, uh, the, the progenitors of this meeting although I have to, for this purpose, although I have to say we thank you again to Richard and OMG for the room and thank you to the IGES Institute for setting this up. They serve as the program manager for the SCC. Uh, how are we going to do all this stuff? Well, we're going to do it, we hope, with three things, voluntary open standards, interoperability, and federation. And we have just enough time to say a word about each of those three things and then to tell you about the bag of standards we've developed so far, and then we're going to go into a panel group. So let me start with voluntary open standards and Mr. Reichardt. Well, there's nothing like starting the day on a discussion about standards, but uh, we're amongst friends, I'm sure. Uh, voluntary open consensus standards are extremely important, as we know. There's a philosophy of carrot and stick. The carrot is, is then when properly adopted, open standards uh, invoke flexibility in systems and softwares and solutions. Um, they allow agility uh, and they save time, money, and in my experience, I've seen open standards save lives, and that's probably the most impactful thing for us on the public service side of our professions. Um, by nature, open standards are developed through a consensus process, like a standards organization that are represented here today. They uh, are free of intellectual property restrictions. Uh, they are voted up, and uh, anyone who has an issue uh, in the development of a standard is able to articulate that issue and have that issue addressed before it's adopted. So it's, it's, a, it's an open, broadly accepted standard. They're freely available without cost in most cases. Uh, I know the standards from my organization and others are freely available without restriction. And they're non-discriminatory. And the whole, the whole point of an open standard is, is that no one organization has control of that standard. It's cared for by a global or a broad body, so you can be assured that they're going to be stable, maintained, and available in the market. Um, and again, I go back to the point that it's all about uh, reducing cost, reducing time to implement new capabilities, um, and to save assets and lives. So I'll leave it at that for a short <coughs> definition of open standards. That's great. Now, we're going to be talking more about geo standards later. I'm going to hold you to that story about how they save lives. Great. Let's do that. Good. Can you talk about interoperability? It's our second big tent point. Okay. You go over like people can see. Uh, interoperability is one of the uh, the foundations for what we're dealing with, and of course, the obvious question is how do you do interoperability in a in a context that is both open and shareable? And one of the things that we have been doing is we've been pursuing. Uh, the discrete characteristics of what interoperability is uh, along a continuum. And uh, it's, it's easy to start off and say that a thing is interoperable at the most in foundational sense if one thing can talk to another thing and they can share stuff. They can share information, they can share data, they can share the context that, that they are in. And so if you can do minimally that, then you have at least one level of interoperability. But there are extensions on, on top of that. There are other things that, that are advisable and, and, and recommended. If, uh, if you move up just one level on top of that, then you want to have some kind of standard for the, the context of the information that is uh, uh, being exchanged. Uh, uh, an EDI type of uh, uh, environment, electronic data interchange, or a NIEM-like environment where everybody agrees to the context of what the information is. If you can uh, uh, come to agreement with these kinds of things, then you have another level, another state of interoperability. And from there, you can move to uh, additional states. You can add additional characteristics. You can, you can start doing things like saying, 
this particular service is in this environment, it wants to discover this thing over here, and then they want to be able to interoperate, and that adds additional capability and additional services. And if you, what a, what a lot of what we're doing is trying to discover and articulate precisely those sets of characteristics that go up and down the stack of interoperability from its most foundational sense to its most expansive sense, and then describe how we can measure opportunities against those kinds of characteristics and those kinds of levels of interoperability. Okay, great, thanks. And you know, uh, why are we talking about this stuff? Uh, sometime in the future as we try and implement all the things that were contemplated in that executive order that Mr. Daniel was talking about this morning, uh, somebody's gonna show up at your office in some agency or in some you know, municipal uh, place in the Kentucky Department of Public Safety or in your enterprise and say, I got a thing and you should use it because it's gonna do all this stuff. Is it open standard? Oh yeah, yeah, it's open as heck. Is it interoperable? It's the interoperablest thing that ever happened, uh, which is great and everybody says that, but in order for us to all actually use stuff that works together, we have to have some kind of operationalized way of measuring that stuff. And I, what, what, what Victor is, is referring to and gently not uh, having to tell you the whole details of is we're deep at work with a bunch of people to try and come up with usable, more detailed tests and definitions and ways of understanding what we really have to have in order to have something that is truly interoperable and safe to unleash on a whole bunch of people and then have them actually able to work together. I'm gonna mention one third characteristic and it's a little uh, different than the other two and it's called federation. Here is what I can tell you from, uh, from open standards world. What we have learned is that frequently uh, uh, data exchanges and information sharing use cases in and outside of government, in and outside of cyber, do not conform to the one ring to rule them all model, okay? This ain't the Lord of the Rings. You don't have a whole bunch of people who want to submit to a central controller. You've got a bunch of independent enterprises, independent agencies, different jurisdictions, sometimes different nations that want to cooperate and share, but within defined terms, under specific circumstances, with defined levels of access control, and so forth and so on. And that's why, if you take a look, at the Executive Order uh, 13691 that was just mentioned, the newest one, the Cyber EO in February, you will see that it says we need standards, but not just, you know, data geek standards and stuff I love, but also we need standards, established principles that we can apply and rely on counterparties who share for contracts, business processes, methodologies, technology, privacy protection. We have to provide a package of guidance that is safe and easy for everybody to use and interoperable that anybody can use and allows folks to deal with each other in confidence and under their own control and to their own level of comfort. So that's what we hope this is about. And before I leave the point of federation, I want to say one more thing about federation. It's four letters, N-E-I-M. Neem.gov is a wonderful example of a taxonomy of shared terms which has been built up over years now through the cooperative effort of a whole bunch of state and federal and other participants trying to find a way to talk about the same darn thing using the same darn phrases, but simply enough that you don't have to have a graduate degree if you're a small agency with one 24-year-old coder who's making you, you know, making all this stuff work, you still have a fighting chance of using it, conforming, and be able to, con you know, communicate successfully with other agencies. So under the Federation model, we expect not a top-down system, but a bottom-up system where people will cooperate and reach these taxonomies and methods and agreements about how to interoperate and share uh, voluntarily, collectively, and, and successfully. That's the game plan. And with that in mind, uh, your Standards Coordination Council, uh, the, the organizations here, is about five or six others already in, involved, and we are hoping to get other organizations who create standards and shared methods to join us, have collected a beginning bag of Lego blocks of standards and standards projects and relevant uh, uh, ongoing uh, sort of potential standards that we think will help. There is a website. You will hear more about it today. The SCC has set up a website under this URL, standardscoordination.org. I'm going to go out of my way to say that you can remember that one, standardscoordination.org. You'll hear more about it later, but what I want to tell you right now is that we spent, as this little tiger team, about three weeks looking for and identifying a first set of 30 to 35 standards and standards projects that we think are uh, a real basis for hope. There's a lot of Lego blocks out there already that can be snapped together to do a lot of the things that the executive order uh, describes. Uh, it is our hope that when people look at that list, they will say, hey, how come my thing is not it? That's what we want. We want more people to give us more information. We want additional parties to communicate with us and build up a larger shared resource. You will see that that website and project interoperability, which we'll be talking about in a minute, uses 
an open solicitation for additional input. There's GitHub nodes, there's ways of contributing additional material. We want the folks who are down in the trenches to feel that they have every bit as much right to donate methods, ideas, comments, plans for how they use standards, problems they're using and having with the standards, to put that stuff into the pipeline so that we all have a better basis for knowing how to do that information sharing. Having said that, please consider both that website and that list of standards and the whole project of project interoperability, an open invitation to the entire community to come work with us to identify best practices, standards, and methods for doing all this important work so that we have a, and this is, I, I have to say this, not the government's word, this is my word, so that we have a more crowdsourced and open government path towards doing information sharing. Remember that one EO isn't the only executive order out there. There's also um, 13642, which was the executive order on open government and machine readable data as the default for federal government work. We are living in an open government world and this is our way of trying to help make cybersecurity happen within that context. Anything else we should add, guys? Can you even add early? Turn over to the panel. Any questions? If you've got questions, you're welcome to them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe somebody's listening somewhere else. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, who is that charming young lady? <laughs> I don't know. Um, today. Uh, this is for Victor. Um, one of the things we talked about as a, one of the principal authors of the I2F, which is the interop ISC interoperability framework, uh, is intrinsic interoperability. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? We're, um, we talk about how we should be building capability and tools and things um, uh, in a way that makes them more intrinsically interoperable. How much time do you want me to? Uh, three minutes. <laughs> three minutes, okay. Well, um, anthropomorphically, we are all interoperable agents, and part of the reason why we are interoperable agents is that we not only share a common language and a common way of communicating, we also share uh, a sense of our common environments, sense of interconnectedness, things like that. And so, as individuals, what we can do is we can walk into situations and discover each other and, and be able to communicate. Intrinsic and interoperability for software is a bit more, uh, and, and systems in general is a bit more uh, involved and necessitates understanding additional things that are necessary for that level of interoperability. Things like the state of one component or one set of services in another state, the vocabulary that's being used or not being used in another context, the uh, even little things that are not so little like the environments in which things are, the provenance on the information, what's the citable source of, this, of the information. If, if Jamie is a, an interoperable agent and I ask him for his social security number and he gives me a, a, a number back, I am taking it on faith that that number that he just made up because he really doesn't want to give me his social security number is indeed a social security number. On the other hand, if we share a contract that the information that we will exchange is that way, then we have a mechanism for sharing that kind of information. So intrinsic interoperability necessitates all these additional sets of services that promote uh, not just integration and coupling and cohesion and those kinds of things, but the provenance and acceptance of the information uh, that is being produced and consumed. Certainly, I was, I was asked to, to uh, answer the question, what comes next? And of course, I don't know, and no one knows. But I'll tell you what we hope to do. We hope that an increasing number of standards organizations will work with us to develop a larger, longer, and better typified list of methodologies so that people can take a look and say, okay, I want to do federation and info sharing on a distributed basis. What are my models? What are my methods? What standards allow me to do that? I want to do secure exchanges. 
I want to have uh, sharing contracts with other organizations so that I know that I can safely present some uh, vulnerability information at the right places and times to the right people, and I want to know it's going to get to the right people, and I want to know what my deal is in terms of what I have to provide. Uh, we want to see all those kinds of methodologies, some of which you will hear about in additional sessions today. Uh, uh, we have a lot of identity access control problems, and uh, John Vondelt's going to talk on that later. There's a bunch of good stuff out there. We want to build and grow that list and then turn it essentially into a set of choices for architectures so that that guy I was talking about before, the 30-year-old at the, the, the Kentucky Department of Public Safety, has a toolkit and a palette to paint with so that he can come play with everybody else and share this stuff more broadly in consensual groups. How's that? We'll be probably talking in about a month. Uh, you know, next, <laughs> Take a look again at the end of April. We hope to have a lot bigger list. And like I said, standardscoordination.org, uh, thank you very much to the folks at uh, uh, IGIS and Open Geospatial for helping us set that up. Are we going to our panel?